Good morning and welcome to our annual Crown Forum honoring alumnus Martin Luther King Jr. Before we begin, I have a couple of announcements. Many of you are aware that on February 14th, Valentine's Day, at 11 in the morning, the college will install its 11th president, Dr. John Sylvanus Wilson, Jr., right here. Academicians from across the nation will gather. There will be a great procession from Forbes Arena. The trustees will be here. The faculty will be here in regalia. The seniors will process. And each class, freshmen, sophomores, and juniors, will also be present in suits and ties, and you will sit together as a class. But only the seniors will join the procession with the faculty and the delegates from across the country. In this connection, I want to inform you that an inaugural writers conference is going to be held in the Bank of America Auditorium Wednesday, January 22nd at 4 p.m. That event will be for those of you interested in writing letters to honor Dr. Wilson that will be bound and presented to him. An inaugural writers conference in the Bank of America Auditorium Wednesday, January 22nd at 4 p.m. An event to help us embellish our honor of President Wilson. This is the 85th birthday anniversary of Martin Luther King, Jr. This year also marks the 50th anniversary of his receiving the Nobel Peace Prize and his delivering his Nobel lecture on ending on nonviolence for ending local and global conflict. Each year we have an annual student essay contest. The deadline for this, you're participating to win a cash prize, is March the 3rd. We encourage you to go online and read Martin Luther King Jr.'s Nobel Lecture. And we'd like you, if you're interested in competing in this contest, to come into the Chapel Library following this Crown Forum, and on the conference table, you'll find all the information stacked there for you to take the flyers that will give you what you need to know to participate. The announcements of the winners will be April 28th, and there will be several cash prizes. And what you are to write on regarding King and his philosophy of nonviolence will be spelled out in the flyers. Now I invite you to rise for our opening prayer by Bain Alexandrian Jones. Won't you please stand? Let us pray. Eternal Spirit, we are grateful, grateful for this moment, grateful that we have the opportunity one more time to be here in this incubator of greatness, knowing that in reality all of life is supporting us in this effort. We acknowledge the great power, the great spirit, the great presence that is giving us the strength, the power, to engage in another semester, to pursue the best within us, and to make the most of the infinite potential that we have. And in this knowledge, we call forth all of the peace, all of the poise, all of the dignity, all of the work ethic, and everything it takes to do what we must do to transform ourselves and to change the world. This is what we are here for and we give thanks for it. In the name of God, we pray, and so it is. 
Amen. Good morning. Oh, the places you will go. You are on your way, and you know what you know. And you are the guy who will decide where you go. Gathered in this sacred space are men who are navigating the tantalizing terrains of time. In pursuit of the places they shall go. Sifting through the sciences, hustling through history, bustling through business, steering through sociology, and maneuvering through mathematics. Where are we going? To palaces of prestige and privilege? To castles of capitalism and consumerism? Or to monarchies of materialism? Ladies and gentlemen, I beg the question, where are we going? Are we going to places of self-gratification that build our own self-interest or places that seemingly commodify our vocations? Or are we going to places that serve the needs of our people, that raise their awareness and heighten their consciousness to up-level their vibratory contributions to the world? Brothers, we are encouraged to follow the directions of self-centered propaganda, reified by social media, but where do you choose to go? We celebrate Dr. King on this day, not because of his Nobel Peace Prize, not even because of his flapping accolades, but simply because of the places he went. He was willing to march in Memphis with sanitation workers. He bore the burdens of Birmingham. He confronted the crisis in Chicago. And he was an antagonist in Atlanta, consequently changing the world. He was willing to go to Montgomery and Memphis, but he refused to be frozen on the National Mall. It is a travesty to commemorate the memory of Dr. King, but not the movement of Dr. King. And perhaps we have become fans of King in so much that we are no longer followers of King, that we become infatuated with his name. But we have failed to internalize his nature. Is it not ironic how we're willing to commend the King that wanted equal rights and civil rights and human rights, but we are quick to critique the King who spoke out against the war in Vietnam? Kingian ethics moves us away from consensus to community. Oh, the places that you will go. You'll look up and down the streets, look them over with care. About some, you will say, I don't choose to go there. Oh, the places you will go. But is there any place a Morehouse man or a man of Morehouse shall not go? Are we willing to empathize and commune with people, to suffer and exist in the inescapable web of mutuality? King did not resolve to reside in the comfort of the North or retire to lofty ivory pulpits, but rather he lived where the people lived. He felt what the people felt. He cried like the people cried because King recognized the inherent value of all human persons and their sacredness. We can't become so full of our accomplishments and self-worth that we neglect to consider the need of our community the need for ethical leaders who can go and speak against the nonsense of a Congress that cuts unemployment bill un benefits for over 1.3 Americans. We need people who will go and refute the cutting of SNAP benefits and persons who will speak to defend everyone's right to dream in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Men of Morehouse and Morehouse men are needed to go, not just to Montgomery, but follow Martin King into Memphis. Because if our calling does not lead us to Memphis, then we have failed to embrace the ethic that undergirds Martin's truth. Because the reality is this, that all of us have to go to Memphis at some point or another. All of us have a date with destiny, a calling to Calvary. There's a gathering at Golgotha and a meeting in Memphis. Let us not deify King in so much that we have made him our ex ex exception and not our example. Let us not be guilty of idolatry by worshiping the king that stands on the mall, but neglecting the king that was the word made flesh. 
And as the pendulum of time fluctuates between right and wrong, and as the universe is equally balanced between good and evil, the places that Morehouse men will go will tip the scale of the universe. So the question becomes, will you exalt the king that went to Montgomery? Or will you embrace the Morehouse martyr in Memphis? Where do we go from here, my brothers? If we can help somebody as we travel along, if we can cheer somebody with a word of song, if we can show somebody that they're traveling wrong, then and only then our living is not in vain. Thank you. This day is not like any other you will experience in the Crown Forum. Because it's my privilege to introduce to you a dear friend who's going to reveal to you a formula that is not so secret as to how Nelson Mandela became a legend, how Martin Luther King Jr was given a statue on the National Mall and a federal holiday. I want you to look at your programs. And you're going to see the name Azim in Kamisa, the top where we put the biographies. I'm going to encourage you to read it. He is going to reveal to you the answers to 
the statements that I've just made. But I'll lift a couple of things for you. Author, activist, and international inspiration speaker. Born in Kenya, West Africa. Trained in mathematics, economics, international finance in the United Kingdom. A successful international investment banker for over 40 years. 40 years experience of doing or conducting business in Africa, the Middle East, Canada, the United States of America, Europe, Asia. But he had to make a radical hairpin turn in his life because of a tragedy. And he's going to talk to you today out of that tragedy and how he responded, learning to take action for societal transformation. He'll talk to you about the Tarek Kamisa Foundation that he established and who he partnered with. Please note when he tells you who he's partnering with. He's going to talk to you about violence and nonviolence and forgiveness. He's reached over 8 million people, been recognized by President William Jefferson Clinton, Attorney General Janet Reno, and honored with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Tit Koppel, and Muhammad Ali. Among his several books, one is titled From Murder to Forgiveness, A Father's Journey. Won't you now give him a Morehouse welcome? a violent crime would forever change the lives of two families and lead to an unbelievable outcome initiated by the victim's father, Azim Kamisa. I worked as an international investment banker, so I traveled the world and um, had a very full life. My son uh, grew up in Seattle with his mom and then after he finished high school, he came to San Diego to study. At, he was a student at San Diego State University, which was nice because he was closer to me. He wanted to become a journalist. But on January 21st, 1995, the father and son's peaceful lives would be irreparably torn apart. While Azim was returning from a business trip in Mexico, Tariq was working a part-time job delivering pizzas. It was the last delivery of the evening, and he was lured to a um, bogus address. Uh, in North Park, and uh, as he was about to leave, he was accosted by four youth gang members, and the 14-year-old fired one round, which entered my son's body under the left shoulder blade, and Tariq died um, a couple of minutes later, um, slumped in the, in the front seat of the car, um, drowning in his own blood over a lousy pizza at the age of 28. Needless to say, it brought my life to a crashing halt. It was like a nuclear bomb that had gone off in my heart. And I went through all the emotions you would anticipate a parent to go through. You know, uh, unbearable grief, despair. I was suicidal at one point. I really did not know how to go on with, go on with my life. But I recognized that if I did not forgive, I would remain a victim and there's no quality of life being a victim. Pless Felix, whose grandson, 14-year-old Tony Hicks, was arrested for the murder, was also facing the terrible news. That feeling of foreboding came on me. First thing I did was to call my daughter. While his mother's eyes filled with tears. And she asked me, she said, do you believe Tony killed somebody? I said, I don't want to believe it. I guess I wanted to not accept that as reality. I knew that life would change forever. 
On January 21st, 1995, I shot and killed Tariq Kamisha. I'm sorry for killing Tariq and hurting his family. I'm sorry for the pain that I caused for Tariq's father, Mr. Kamisha. I pray to God every day that Mr. Kamisha will forgive me for what I've done. My grandfather promised me that he would be Mr. Kamisha's friend and help him in any way he can for the rest of his life. I'm very sorry for what I've done. For the first time in California, a 14-year-old was prosecuted as an adult. The other three gang members were apprehended and received prison sentences. Tony confessed to the murder, waiving his right to a trial, and received a sentence of 25 years to life in prison. Who is the enemy here? Is it the 14-year-old that killed my son? Or is it the societal forces that forced a young African-American boy to join a gang at the age of 11, and then to prove himself to the gang, he shot and killed my son. With forgiveness in his heart, Azim decided to pick up the pieces and take a remarkable step. Nine months after Tariq's death, Azim started an organization to work against youth violence in at-risk communities called the Tariq Kamisa Foundation. I want to thank, uh, thank you for inviting uh, Tariq Kamisa Foundation to bring our Violence Impact Forum. And especially today, because today is exactly the 16th anniversary of this tragedy. With him on stage is Pless Felix, whom Azim reached out to shortly after the murder and asked to join him in his anti-violence work. We needed to share the story of how Tariq and Tony's paths crossed and how it resulted in the death of one person and the life of another person changing instantly and forever. And I said to him, you know, I cannot do anything to bring my son back from the dead. He's gone. And you can't do anything to get your grandson out of prison. And I've started this foundation with the mission of stopping kids from killing kids. I can't do this by myself. The real reason I'm here is ask for your help. Azim and Pless forged a close bond of friendship. They regularly visit schools and speak to kids about the tragedy that brought them together and the lessons they've learned. His grandson killed my son and we are brothers. I have made relationships like Pless because of forgiveness. Tony was like you all, but Tony also was a very angry person. One thing about angry people, angry people are not thinking people. The real reason we are here is for you, because we don't want you to die like Tariq, or we don't want you to end up in prison like Tony. That's why we're here, because every one of you in this room is a very important person. But how many of you here have lost a family member as a result of violence? So put your hand up. So you know about this pain. What would you do? How many of you here would want revenge if your brother or your sister was killed? Yeah? I get it. We reached over 8 million kids. And through our story, we are teaching the principles of nonviolence, of compassion, of empathy, of forgiveness, of peacemaking. Because violence is a learned behavior. No kid was born violent. If you accept that as a truism, then nonviolence can also be a learned behavior. But you have to teach it. These kids are not going to learn that by osmosis. In the 15 years of Azim's work with the Foundation, he has traveled the world and earned recognition from presidents and global luminaries like the Dalai Lama, but his focus has never wavered. So I teach this work today that forgiveness is something you do for yourself. It is healthy to forgive. Now, the, the, the magic about it is that through forgiveness, I've been able to heal.
Thank you and uh, good morning, students. When I was your age, I had a lot more energy than that. Good morning, students. Good morning. That's much better. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dean Carter, for your introduction, but more importantly, for 35 years of leading this wonderful institute in the legacy of Martin Luther King, Jr. Let's acknowledge my family. Darkness cannot drive darkness, only light can. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can. One of my favorite quotes by Martin Luther King, Jr. And truly was a champion of nonviolence and peacemaking. And I have listened to most everything he ever said and like to follow in his footsteps. Because I truly believe that peace is possible. My path, however, came to peace through forgiveness. And I've been an avid writer. I keep a very active journal. And I remember soon after I lost my son, Tariq. He was my only son. I have a beautiful daughter, but he was my only son. I remember putting this in my journal. There's nothing quite so painful as a broken heart. There's nothing quite so painful as a broken heart. But a broken heart is an open heart. If one can learn to live with an open heart, gentle transformations begin to happen. And part of my goals today is to open your hearts. Because if you have open hearts, it's easier to receive love and to transmit love. And I think that this is very important if you are going to create a world that is peaceful and that is nonviolent, to be able to live and remain with open hearts. Now, needless to say, my heart was broken wide open. Tariq was my only son. He was a university student, much like you. And he worked as a pizza delivery man on Fridays and Saturdays. And it was his turn to go make the delivery. He was accosted by four young, young men. Three of them were 14-year-old. The leader of the gang was an 18-year-old who handed a 9mm handgun. And as my son was leaving the site of the crime, which was an apartment building, not far from where he went to school. The 18-year-old gave the order, Busting Bones, it was his gang nickname, and he fired one round, which entered my son's body under the left shoulder blade, traveled across the upper part of this body, and it actually exited from the right armpit, but it was fatal. And as the coroner explained to me afterwards, he said the bullet followed a perfect path. A perfect path, I queried. I thought that was an interesting choice of words. But he was very quick to tell me, Mr. Kamisa, I'm not trying to be insensitive. We do not see a path like this very often. And it destroyed all the vital organs in your son's body, and Tariq died, drowning in his own blood a couple of minutes later over a lousy pizza at the age of 20. The sudden, senseless death of an innocent, unarmed human being. The overwhelming grief of a family. The total confusion as you try to absorb a new, hideous reality. One of the hardest things I ever had to do in my life was to call his mother. I live in San Diego, California. She lives in Seattle, Washington. It's quite far, so I had to actually call her on the telephone. How do you tell a mother that she's never, ever going to see her son again or give him a hug? How do you do that? Tariq had a very special relationship with his mother. I have a very special relationship with my mother. I'm sure that many of you can relate. And although this was 19 years ago, next Tuesday is the 19th anniversary of this tragedy, I remember those early days very clearly 
And it took me a while, but eventually when I told her what had happened to Tariq, she let out this loud, piercing shriek as she hit the floor. I could actually hear her hit the floor. And when I tell this story, I can hear her inner, I can hear her shriek in my inner ear, and it will probably haunt me for the rest of my life. So why am I sharing this with you? Because it is painful. Because sometimes we don't quite get how painful violence is till it happens to us. At least I didn't get it. But now, now I really, really, really get how painful violence is. And because I really, really get how painful violence is, I would never, never in my life be violent to another human being. And that's why I'm sharing this with you, because it's not important that only I get it. It is important we all get it. And I'm particularly honored to address you because most of you, as you leave Morehouse, will be leaders in your communities. It's very important that we never, ever practice violence. Violence is a learned behavior. Nonviolence can also be a learned behavior. And Martin Luther King Jr. taught us all of those principles. And it's important that each one of you, as you go into your new lives, practice these principles because there's way too much violence in our society. And I'm sure that you all know that. Now, I took a little different response to this tragedy. I saw that there were victims at both ends of the gun. I saw that my son was a victim of the 14-year-old. I saw Tony, the 14-year-old, as a victim of our society. And that begs the question... Well, who is society? Well, in my humble opinion, society is not just happenstance. Every one of us who is an American is responsible for the society we have created. And children killing children is not a mark of a civil society. We like to think we are a civil society. But there's way too much violence. We are by far the most violent first world nation in the world. And that's not a good thing, because we are the only superpower which is shifting. But currently, we are the only superpower, and we are exporting this violence. So it was with this attitude, and as an American citizen, I was born in Kenya, as Larry introduced me, but I moved to the United States in the middle 70s and naturalized as an American citizen, and I felt as an American citizen, that I must take my share of the responsibility for the bullet that took my son's life because it was fired by an American child. And quite frankly, I believe every caring American should do the same. So it was with this attitude that I formed the Tari Kamisa Foundation, and our mission is to stop kids from killing kids by breaking the cycle of youth violence, and we essentially have three mandates. Our first mandate is to save lives of children because we lose way too many on a, on a daily basis. Our second mandate is to empower the right choices so kids don't end up with gangs and guns and violence and drugs and alcohol. And our third mandate is to teach the principles of nonviolence, of empathy, of compassion, of forgiveness, and most importantly, of peacemaking. And I didn't start with much money. I started with $8,000 in my home office, and with the grace of God, the work has now become international. We're over 45 employees. And I've also created a couple more organizations that target children's safety as well as youth violence. And I reached out to the grandfather that you met him on the video soon after I started it, and we're still together 19 years later. I would never have met him at his grandson not kill my son, and we've been brothers, and we'll be together for the rest of our lives doing this work. Five years after the tragedy, I went to meet the young man who murdered my son. He was 19 years old. And I remember at at one point, and I went with the grandfather who I'd known for a while, 
I told my grandfather I need some alone time with Tony because I felt he'd be more open without his grandfather. And I remember at one point, and he left us, just Tony and me, we spoke man to man for an hour and a half. And at one point, I remember he and I locked eyeballs. And we held that glance for a very long time. I was sitting very close to him, much closer than I am to the front line of this audience. And I'm looking in his eyes trying to find a murderer. And I didn't find a murderer. I was able to climb through his eyes and touch his humanity. That I got that the spark in him was no different than the spark in me or in any one of you in the audience. At that point, I told him, Tony, not only have I forgiven you, I want you to know when you come out of prison, you have a job waiting for you at the Tariq Kamisa Foundation. Next day, the grandfather called me, said, Azim, that meeting you had with Tony was transformative for him. And I said, it was also transformative for me. I wish I had done that earlier. I don't know why I waited five years. He says, as you were leaving, Tony told me, Daddy, because Tony lived with his grandfather. Daddy, that's a special man. I killed his one and only son. Not only has he forgiven me, he's offered me a job. I'm not worthy of his forgiveness and his job offer, but I'm going to do my best. He's 33 years old now. At 22, he aced his GED, self-taught himself while he was in Pelican Bay, which is a maximum security prison in California. He's 12 units away from his child psychology, and I just finished my fourth book, From Fulfillment to Peace, And Tony actually wrote the foreword to it and did a great job. Great job. So you can see the power of forgiveness. And let me just finish. I don't have a lot of time this morning because we have a short program. I'd like to finish with a a quote that I wrote in my journal, which was the basis of my fourth book, and it goes like this. Sustained goodwill creates friendship. Now, that ought to be obvious. You don't make friends by bombing them. You make friends by extending goodwill. So sustained goodwill creates friendship. Sustained friendship creates trust. Sustained trust creates empathy. Sustained empathy creates compassion, and sustained compassion creates peace. So I call this my peace formula. It starts with goodwill, goes to friendship, goes to trust, goes to empathy, goes to compassion, that goes to peace. But people always ask me, how do you extend goodwill to the person who murdered your child? I tell them you do that through forgiveness. As it's evident, it worked for me, it worked for my family. What's a miracle, it worked for him and it worked for his family. It can work for you, and you, and you, and you, and your families. It can work for Palestine and Israel, North and South Korea, Afghanistan, Iran, Syria, Iraq. It can work for the United States of America. Indeed, it can work for the world. So my brothers and my sisters, let me leave you with this thought, that peace is possible. How do I know that? Because I am at peace. Thank you very much, and good morning. Peace, nonviolence, forgiveness, and love are everywhere, except where you are blocking it. The Alphas, would you come and stand here? The Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel Assistants, would you come and stand here? The rest of the audience, please rise. You're leading.
Now, the two groups, representative of the philosophy of Dr. King, of course you all know it was the Alphas who led the campaign to build the statue on the mall, the National Mall, and the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel Assistants who host Dr. Kamisa in a luncheon dialogue in the African American Hall of Fame after this Crown Forum, and he will address them at 5.30 in the chapel library and appear with Bernice King in the Ray Charles Center tomorrow. Check the schedule on King Week if you'd like to attend. They are going to now go up the aisle with the reef for the statue as we traditionally do, and you may start while we're singing the college hymn. 